So we're back in the book of Acts. We took last week off from VBS, in which we looked at Romans chapter 5, and we looked at basically the gospel message, the words of what exactly makes up the gospel. What is the good news about Jesus dying on the cross and therefore making us right, making us in many ways friends with God? And today we go back, we come back to our series, Viral, Stories from the Gospel, Stories from the Book of Acts. In many ways it is a gospel, but stories from the book of Acts as we look at what exactly it was that God intended when he laid out, when he commissioned and sent out his apostles, sent out his disciples to go out into the world and to spread this gospel, to become a viral movement. What exactly was God's plan? What did it look like? What is it going to look like? How does that happen? How does that work? And in many ways, what do we what do we as individuals and what do we as faith Christian fellowship need to do in response to that to become a viral movement in our own right? We're looking this morning at an event that is, I would say, probably the second most important thing to ever happen to the church. The first event being Jesus' own death and resurrection, securing our salvation, securing our ability to be made right with God. The second being the day of Pentecost. Yeah, I know, we just talked about Pentecost a couple weeks ago, so this is kind of like a repeat in many ways, but so often what I found, at least in my own life, is that when I look at churches, when we go to church, when we go to church on Pentecost Sunday, usually the day of Pentecost is taken kind of by itself. It's sort of pulled out of its context and it's looked at as this great day to celebrate in its own right, which is true, but we rarely ever hear what this larger context was of Pentecost. What made Pentecost so special? What made it so good? What made it a day really worth celebrating? What made it the second most important event in the life of the church? So that's where we're going today. We're going to the day of Pentecost. Before we go there, let me offer up a real quick prayer a second. Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to pray that you bless our study, that you bless our time here spent in your word, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, that we would receive your word, receive your message for us, and that we would be motivated, that we would be compelled by your love for us to return the favor. In Jesus' name. Amen. So Acts chapter 2 is where we're going this morning. It's to Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. What we've had, what we've seen so far is that when Jesus left, when Jesus was, when the disciples went out to the Mount of Olives, about 40 days or so after his resurrection, they went out to the Mount of Olives and Jesus left the, his disciples, soon to become known as apostles, he left them with a commission, the great commission, a command to go out into the world to share this good news, to be witnesses of everything they've seen, with everybody, everybody, everywhere. Talked about, you know, I've, I've already made the suggestion that maybe it might be better, you know, as we think about the Great Commission, so often we think about it as a command, and maybe it might be better for us not to think of it so much as a command, but as a promise. Yes, there is an active part of it. There is a role that we have to play, something that we need to do with the Great Commission. But in many ways, we're being promised, we're being encouraged by Jesus saying, look, be my people, be my witnesses, and I promise you will become viral. You will become a great, great body. You will become, you will become a global movement. And so the disciples, Jesus is taken up back up into heaven, and the disciples go back to Jerusalem as, as, as Jesus had originally commanded them. They go back to Jerusalem and they wait, because that was, after all, the first thing that Jesus said. Go back to Jerusalem and wait. They go back to Jerusalem. They go back to the room, the upper room, of, which we assume is the upper room where they were you know, so long before. They go back to the upper room and they wait and they pray. They do this for 10 days, and you can kind of imagine, because we can kind of think of ourselves, if we spent 10 days praying, we kind of start to feel like we're not doing anything. Just nothing's happening. We're not accomplishing anything. What are we doing here? And they spend 10 days praying. And I believe it's those 10 days that they spent praying that lays the foundation for what we're looking at this morning. So Acts chapter 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. 
Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. And when they heard this sound, the crowd came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and and the parts of Libya near Cyrene, visitors from Rome, both Jews and converts to Judaism, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? Some, however, made fun of them, and they said they have had too much wine. So ten days they spent praying, ten days they spent waiting and wondering what is going to happen. They knew the promise they had. They knew that Jesus had promised to do something great, had promised to send the Holy Spirit upon them, and they were waiting because they didn't know when exactly this was going to happen. They were waiting. And one day while they were waiting, one day while they were praying, During those 10 days, feeling like nothing is happening, there was a buzz that was starting to kind of fill the area around them. The city was coming alive. Jerusalem was becoming crowded and populated with people as people from all around the world began to come in and fill the city and fill the temple courts. This was a celebration of Pentecost. And I... Like me, anyways, where I grew up, you know, kind of thinking that, okay, what's this whole deal of Pentecost? Pentecost, it's kind of this fancy name. It's this name that, you know, obviously the church gave to this event because, well, such an important event needs a name. But the reality is that Pentecost is actually a name given to this day and to this event by Jews. This was actually what I, what, I, what I have so rarely heard and only heard glimpses of in the past. Pentecost was actually one of the three most holy celebrations, three, three most holy festivals in Judaism. It was this day, this festival, otherwise known as the Festival of Weeks, as it's referred to in Leviticus. It was this festival that was intended to celebrate God's goodness and God's providence in the first fruits. This was when the first harvest for the year was thought to be, to be, you know, to be harvested. And so everybody would come, Jews all over the place would come to Jerusalem, come to the temple to celebrate this day of Pentecost, this Feast of Weeks. As time went on, as we get into kind of the intertestamental period, the period in between the Old and New Testaments, Jews started to actually add some other elements into it. And what happened is that this went from being just the Feast of Weeks, just the time when they would celebrate a harvest, to also being a time of covenant renewal. So every year at the Feast of Pentecost, the high priest would read the law. They would remember, they would think back and be, 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 be uh, reminded of the giving of the law to Moses on Mount Sinai way back in Exodus. That was the event at Mount Sinai. That was the event that most Jews, that Jews looked at as being, this is, this is when we began. It was at the giving of the, of the law. This is when we became, went from being this enormous group of people, disorganized and unsure about where we were going and what we were doing. This is when we as a nation, as Israel, really became a nation, really became a chosen people, a people set apart, set aside, devoted to God as a holy nation. So in many ways, what we're looking at here with this, with this day of Pentecost, this was Israel's birthday. We could really look at it that way. This was the day that Israel remembered where they came from. They remembered their roots. I kind of looked at this, and as I was looking at this and thinking about this and, and you know, kind of going over the material and studying this and preparing for this, I started to realize now, wait a minute. You have Pentecost, otherwise known as the Feast of Weeks. It's a celebration of the harvest, the celebration of the first fruits, and this was something that was set up all the way back. We can read about this all the way back in Leviticus, where God talks about these festivals, and this is where the Holy Spirit comes. Fifty days before Pentecost is the Jewish feast of Passover, where Jesus, our Savior, is offered up as the Passover lamb and sacrificed for our sins. And if you ask me, I'm looking at this and I'm thinking, this is a plan at least 1,500 years in the making. 
This was not a happenstance thing. This was not coincidence. This was not, this was not a day that things just kind of happened to work out that way. This was something that God had orchestrated from who knows when in the past to make it all work out so perfectly. He made it all work out so that Jesus was going to be sacrificed on Pentecost, risen again, and he would go back up and ascend into heaven, and then the Holy Spirit would come down and infuse in the church and empower the church for ministry on, during a festival of harvest. This was a plan 1,500 years in the making. And take a look at verse 1 again. When the day of Pentecost came, when the day of Pentecost came, literally the Greek reads, on the fulfillment of, of the day of Pentecost. Fulfillment. Fulfillment is this covenantal term. It's this term that we attach to covenants, you know, promises that God makes or two people make between each other. And when we say something is fulfilled, that covenant has been fulfilled in the Greek. And Luke actually pulls this out and he says, this is not just on the day that Pentecost came because this was the day it was scheduled. This is where it fell on the calendar. This was on the fulfillment of Pentecost. So now you have not just this plan that's 1,500 years in the making. You have this event in which God, orchestrating all this out at some point in the past, comes along and he says, no, today, on this day, at Pentecost, among all these people, when people from all around the world are coming to Jerusalem, that is the day that I am going to fulfill my promises to the church. This is the day that I am going to send my spirit. Next week, we're going to talk about what all of this kind of signifies and the meaning. So you're going to have to kind of bear with me here a little bit. I'm kind of teasing things out a little bit, but that's that's okay. It gives you something to think about for the next week. This is the day that we are going to fulfill, that I am going to fulfill the promise of Pentecost. And what that kind of means, okay, I'll touch on it a little bit because I I have to. I can't just let it sit there. I'm bad at keeping secrets. So what we have here is that what God is saying is that because I'm sending the Spirit down at Pentecost, This is the beginning of a new era. This is the beginning of a new era for my people. This is the day that I am not just simply saying that, you know, it's, you, you wait. No, the waiting is over. The waiting, the, the period of sitting around and doing nothing, the period of sitting and praying and doing all these good pietistic Christian things that my people should be doing, that day is over because the day has come that we are now in a new era. This is a new day for the church. This is the day in which I am saying you first, you were completely incapable without the Spirit. Now you have the Spirit. Now the waiting is over. Go and do something. Today is the day that I am going to make you a global church. Today is the day that I am going to empower you to become viral. Today is that day. When the spirit of Pentecost came, They were all together in one place, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. They saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. You ever prepared for something? I'm going to guess probably most of us have probably, probably went to school at some point in our life. You know, many of us have, many of us went to college, many of us went to certain vocational training and we were taught all these different skills and all these different things that we needed to know in order to do our job well, in order to actually launch into our career and build our career. I was thinking about this and actually thinking about this yesterday and the events of yesterday at at the San Francisco airport and I was thinking, okay, how many of those crew members on board that flight had ever experienced anything like that before? And yet... For all the experience they had, and I think the captain had actually been a captain. He'd he'd been flying planes for 20-something years. In 20-something years, this was the first time he had ever been, most likely, had ever been in a plane crash. For those flight attendants, this was the first time they had ever found themselves in a crisis situation in which the plane they're on is blowing up and they have to deploy the chutes and get people off that plane but they've been taught and they've been trained to do it. For those of you, I know there's a number of us in this congregation who um, have worked in the medical field in various capacities. You go to school and you train, especially for for those who may have been nurses who are working in emergency situations and crisis situations. You're trained and you're equipped and you're prepared for dealing with a certain situation. And when the day comes, what happens? I know for me, growing up in California, earthquakes are, you know, it's a fact of life. 
It happens. I remember growing up in elementary school and even in the valley, we would have, in addition to fire drills, we would have earthquake drills in which we were taught when the alarm goes off, when a certain thing goes off, everybody jumps underneath their desk and they turn their back to the windows and keep from getting shattered by, you know, hit by shattering glass and, and protected by the roof caving in on you and everything else. But I remember on October 17, 1989, when I was standing in my kitchen in the 89 quake hit, I froze. I... I First of all, I had no idea what was going on. All of a sudden, the chandelier's shaking, and I couldn't stand upright, and I didn't know what was happening, but I froze, and I think we've probably all found ourselves in that kind of a situation. We're trained. We're prepared for something, and when we finally find ourselves for the first time in a situation where we need to put that training into practice, we kind of freeze. Maybe not long. Maybe we just completely shut down. Maybe it's just for a split second. But there's a part of us that makes us think, hold on a second. What, what is this? What's going on? Is this really happening? I look at these first three verses and everything that's going on here. And I think to myself, wow. I mean, the disciples... The Jews had all the information they needed to understand what was happening in this moment, and yet there's still a part of them all the way down in, in, verse, uh, in verse 12 where the crowd is asking, what does this mean? Let me show you what I mean up in those first three verses. So we're sitting there, and suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind. Violent wind. Let me focus on that for a second. The word for wind, the Greek word for wind, is, can actually be used interchangeably depending on the context. Sometimes it's translated as wind like it is here. Sometimes it's translated as spirit, as in the Holy Spirit. It's the same word. Hebrew does the exact same thing. It's the same word depending on the context. And then there's this word blowing in our text. Luke had the option of picking a couple of different words that could be translated as blowing. The one that he chose in this context, in, this, in our text right here, this is the only time in the New Testament that word is used. We go back, there's a, um, there's a Greek translation of the Old Testament that Luke was most likely using, and there's a number of very significant uses of the Greek word that he uses here that I think are setting the precedence. And one of those is in Genesis chapter 2, where God breathed his spirit into Adam and gave life to humanity. Another key instance, I think, comes up in Ezekiel 37, the valley of the dry bones, where there's this wind that blows across the valley and gives life to these dry bones. It's also a messianic text. And here Luke takes this word, the only place, and he says this wind was blowing. Feast of weeks, covenant renewal, Pentecost, harvest. And here we have this image of the Spirit bringing life into the church. Let me keep going. There's um, tongues of fire. Take a look at this phrase, tongues of fire. Fire, this is a supernatural fire, supernatural, the supernatural, inexplicable fire everywhere in the Bible. Every single instance is always understood as a sign of God's presence among his people. Holy Spirit, breathing life into his church. Fire, supernatural fire is a sign of God's presence. And finally, he came to rest on each of them. Again, Luke has the option of using a couple different words for the word rest, but the word he uses is this word that talks about permanency. It's not just simply that you're tired, the spirit was tired, and he was going around, and he decided he needed some place to sit down, and so he sat down and took a rest, intending to get up and go somewhere else again. The spirit came, and it rested on the church, it rested on God's people, and it rested there with the intention of being permanent, of staying put, of taking up residence and never leaving. The signs were there. Disciples could see what was happening. The time has come. The waiting is over. It's time to do something. It's time to go. Verse 4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. Now there were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. When they heard the sound 
a crowd came together in bewilderment because each had heard his own language being spoken. Utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? Then how is it that each of us hears them in our native language? And then down to verse 11, the second half of verse 11. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. We talked about in the very first week of doing with Acts, we talked about these four observations, these four maybe pillars might be a better way of talking about it. And one of those was this idea that we cannot do anything. We are actually incapable of doing anything and carrying out this mission that he has called us to unless we have been sort of infused with the Holy Spirit. Unless we have received the Holy Spirit, we have the Holy Spirit working in us, we can't do anything. And now here we have this scene in verse 4 and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. We're not talking about tongues. When we talk about tongues, we're not talking about tongues here in the sense of these, these undecipherable languages like we might see and hear about among, among you know, our Pentecostal and charismatic brothers and sisters. What we're talking about here is actual languages, known languages of the people that are around us. But these are languages, presumably, that the disciples did not know. This was a supernatural event, but the only way they could do it is because the Spirit enabled them. It's driving home this emphasis that we are dependent upon the Spirit. And while the Spirit came, and while the Spirit came and took up residence, permanent residence on God's people, we know that we have the Spirit and can carry out this mission that He has called us to. As I said before, this is a new era for the church. This is a new time, a new period, a new beginning. Now, the worst staying in Jerusalem. God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven. You know, it's kind of natural for us to be scared. It's natural for us to kind of be scared when it comes to thinking about what does God want me to do? What's his mission that I want to do? And yet he called us and he commissioned us to have this global ministry throughout the world. And here, God is, not, God is actually kind of making this easy for him. It's one of the reasons you know, I talked about, you know, seeing this as a promise. This is one reason why I kind of tend to see the Great Commission as a promise. This isn't, a, this isn't an event, in a, in an instance, where God is not just sending the disciples. The disciples are expected to go out. God is bringing the people to them. It's in this moment, in this moment where the disciples go from being a ragtag group about the same as we have here to being that global movement that he promised they would be. You know, I'm not, when you think about, you know, how does this get put in practice, and I'm not, I don't know, I mean, I, I'm still pretty new here. I still don't know, I'm still trying to learn the ropes, I'm still trying to figure things out, but as I was thinking about this, I'm thinking, okay, you know, where are we? Because it's kind of one of the questions that we have. Where are we? What are we doing? We always want to know, when we look at these texts, what do we do with this? And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, as much as I want to be an Acts 2 church and an Acts 2 Christian right now, Honestly, I think right now we're still in Acts 1. And that's not a bad thing. And I don't say that to discourage because the reality is we can't get to Acts 2 without first going through Acts 1. I know I'm backing up here a little bit. But there's still this point that the disciples had to wait in order to get to be Acts 2. And Acts 2 was the promise, was the fulfillment of the promise. When we think about ourselves, we need to go through this process of first waiting before we receive. In many ways, I think we are still as an Acts 1 church, and what that means is not that we're getting beat up, not that we're failing, but actually I tend to look at that as we got some good stuff coming down the road. I tend to look at that as because we're an Acts 1 church, we actually we have, we are in a situation where we have something to look forward to. We have some exciting stuff coming down the road. There's good stuff that's coming. There's things that God is going to do that's going to completely blow our mind and it's going to blow this door, these doors off this church. Because right now, what we're working on is trying to figure out what exactly is it that God is saying. We're saying, God, show us. Reveal the way. Pray. We're praying right now. We should be praying. And day is coming in which we will transition from this Acts 1 church to this Acts 2 church so that we can, too, become this viral movement that the early church was. We're still waiting. That's okay. 
One more point in verse 11. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Last week we talked about, um, you know, preaching this gospel and we talked about our need for this gospel. And so often I was actually amazed by this when I was looking at this, that what God is doing here, what God is, what's actually happening is that the first, the first experience the world has of the church is not, you're a sinner, you need Jesus, so accept him and you're going to be saved. It's holy, holy, holy. The first experience that the church has, that the world has with the church, is not this hardcore, you're, you're a sinner, you're bad, and you're evil, and so you need to accept Jesus, and then you can come and worship with us. The first experience they have is of a group of people so overcome by the Holy Spirit that all they can do is praise God. And it's that praise, it's that worship in their own languages, that is what draws them to, that's what draws the crowd to the early church. They hear all of this going on, and they're amazed They're amazed that they're hearing all this stuff in their own language, and what they're hearing is the wonders of God, the greatness of God. The church, the early church, the disciples, were in a position where all they could do was praise him. See, the way we tend to do is we tend to go backwards. We tend to say, you know, first you've got to be good. First you've got to become a good person, so to speak. First you've got to, you know, you've got to get the right answers. You've got to get everything settled. You've got to be right with God. And then you can come and worship with us. And what the early church was doing, what made them viral, was first they said, no, we're going to praise God. We're going to make God known. And that is what people were drawn to. That's so different from the way we tend to think of it. That's so different from the way we tend to operate and work things and and strategize and and make up all these plans and and, and policies and everything else. The first thing the the world saw was our praise of God. This morning, this morning we are installing, commissioning, in many ways ordaining new office bearers. Wendy Padmas as elder, Matt John and Joel Faber as deacon. These are individuals that we as a congregation have come to recognize and acknowledge and, and you know, confirm gifting that says that these three individuals are in fact equipped and empowered by God to do ministry and to hold these positions. It's easy for us as a church to look to our leadership and look to our council and say that these are the people who are really doing the ministry. The rest of us, we just kind of need to hang out and you know, keep throwing our money at them and show up and help out with stuff. One of the great things about Pentecost is that we now have this promise and this assurance that each and every one of us has the Holy Spirit. Each and every one of us has this empowerment. Each and every one of us has been given this gift this fulfillment of this promise to carry out the work of ministry. So while, yes, while we do look to our leaders and look to these three today and the others in the council, we still have that personal responsibility. We are waiting. We are still praying. But God does bring opportunity our way as well on a daily basis. He does bring those open doors.